Okay, so welcome everybody to this. Uh, welcome everybody to this after lunch uh, seminar on workers' rights in Europe, which is part of a series that European Alternatives and Another Europe is Possible have been putting together uh, throughout this year of discussions about the situation of workers' rights in three key economic sectors in the platform and delivery, delivery sector, in the care sector, and in the sector of agricultural work. We've had uh, discussions throughout this year with workers from those different sectors exploring their different uh, problems at work. And the idea today is to be in dialogue with uh, the European institutions. And we've got representatives of the European Commission and the European uh, Parliament with us that I will introduce in just a moment. Uh, the background of this um, series of, 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 of activities and research is really the sense um, that uh, workers' rights in Europe are um, fragile uh, and in a changing economy, uh, new ways of abusing workers' rights um, are, are, are emerging um, and reinforcing also long-standing tendencies in some uh, sectors. Of course, all of that was amplified by uh, the pandemic in many ways, and each of the sectors we're going to be talking about today uh, has been to some extent in the spotlight um, during the pandemic period. And um, noise has been made and announcements have been made, but of course the, the changes don't always come quickly enough. Uh, just, uh, just a couple of days ago we heard uh, in France, where I'm speaking to you from, that Deliveroo will be taken to court um, with a criminal court uh, with regards to undeclared labour. Um, the, there has been cases uh, concerning care workers in Germany that have been uh, found favourable uh, to, the, to, 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 to the care worker um, who was not getting holiday pay, not getting sick pay. Uh, agricultural workers, particularly over this summer, uh, the dangers of their uh, working conditions, but also last year at the beginning of the pandemic, have been very much in the public spotlight in several in several countries, countries where they're often in the spotlight, um, like Italy and in Spain, but also in countries where um, the situation of seasonal workers perhaps hasn't always had so much attention, for example, um, in, in Germany. So each of these uh, topics is, is quite uh, topical. Um, the, another, so aware of that, but also aware that the European Union um, is saying that it's taking uh, these issues and what's called the social pillar of the European Union, um, perhaps more seriously. Um, the creation of the European Labour Authority, which we will mention uh, today, um, a couple of years ago, and it's just starting to start its work now, is an opportunity perhaps uh, to reinforce some of the rights of these workers uh, throughout Europe. The European Commission has announced that it will um, make a pro legislative proposal when it comes to platform work uh, later on this year in December, and the European Parliament just passed a resolution about that uh, last week, which we will no doubt hear more about. Uh, President von der Leyen made a reference to a uh, care strategy uh, for the European Union uh, in her State of the Union speech just, just a week ago. And this week, uh, it is um, a campaign of the European institutions and the European Labour Authority in particular called Rights for All Seasons, uh, which is about the rights of seasonal workers um, uh, being respected all seasons. Rights for All Seasons sounds perhaps a little bit like a series of concertos by Vivaldi, but it's also an important um, claim about the, the rights of, of seasonal workers. So let's talk about these, these issues and today we're gonna deep dive deeper into them. The way it's going to work is we will hear first um, from Ori Mittenmeyer, who uh, worked as a delivery driver um, and from Kinga Milankovic, uh, who works as a care worker um, about their working experiences, their uh, experiences of trying to work with us to advance rights in, in their work and their recommendations to the European institutions. Um, we had hoped to have, we had organized to have an agricultural worker 
join as well, but in the end that doesn't that doesn't work out, which is a sign um, that people's lives are, are, are complicated and perhaps particularly complicated uh, for seasonal workers these days. So I will try to say also some things about the situation of seasonal workers. So that's kept in the conversation. Um, we will dive a little bit deeper into the situation of uh, the care industry uh, with Leila Minano, uh, a journalist joining us who has investigated the, the way this industry is developing across uh, Europe and perhaps what what implications that might have for workers' rights. And then we're going to get some reaction and dialogue uh, from Dennis Genton, who's uh, from the European Commission, and Agnes Jongerius, who is uh, from the European Parliament. So that is the structure of the afternoon. Um, if uh, you have questions um, or comments, write them in the chat if you're joining us uh, via Zoom, and we'll try to have uh, plenty of moments for, for discussion both during and also towards the end of the uh, session. So without uh, more words from me, I want to turn to Ori. Um, Ori, you, you worked as a, a delivery rider in Germany. Uh, please could you share with us uh, what, was the, what that was like and perhaps some of the uh, challenges when it came to your rights as a delivery rider? Yes, good evening, uh, or I think good morning, because I'm right now in Seoul, in South Korea, so sometimes I'm mixing up the times, so it's really late here. Um, thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm always very happy to talk about our experience, and I hope that the connection is pretty stable. Yeah, it seems to be fine, Ori. Yes, okay, I'm guessing it is. Um, yeah, um, uh, as you already said, I was once a writer um, at Deliveroo and Fedora, and uh, um, what the problem was at these times when I was working is that I was in a pretty much precarious situation already before I even entered the companies. Um, uh, after I started to work as a writer, my situation became even more precarious. I had no opportunity to change the situation because uh, my my own mobile phone my jacket and dress um, if you have a little bit experience with um, bike equipment you know that you have to get stuff um, who is always strong enough and fit enough um, to, to to work in like in winter in summer in fall and spring and that you need some different equipment that is very expensive um, we got paid like minimum wage, but the minimum wage wasn't enough so that we could uh, pay our equipment and our rent. So basically every month we were really afraid that um, we wouldn't be able to pay our rent anymore. And it was a very dangerous job um, because we have been supervised by our own mobile phone and with the help of an app the companies has developed. And this app were basically tracking everything we did, like they tracked um, every movement, they tracked our speed, they tracked where we were like stopping. And um, when the numbers didn't fit, then uh, Deliveroo called us. When they called us, they never like were trying to be supportive. They were trying to threaten us by saying things like, okay, you need to drive faster. Why you are so slow? Uh, other riders are faster than you. And if you want to have a new contract, which is also a very important thing to notice, that we were in contracts who were limited of working. You know, every six months you might get a new contract. And even though when you are getting um, a new contract after six months, you were allowed to have it up to four times because in Germany, um, after two years, um, normally the law says that you have to be uh, in a new contract which is unlimited, but since we are talking about Deliveroo or Fedora, they never really cared for us workers. They always um, talk to us out on the streets um, after two years, but before that they were giving us promises, but wage promises like, hey, um, we like how, you, how hard you were working, keep it up and maybe we will give you an unlimited contract. Um, so as you can see that uh, our situation wasn't very nice and it was very hard for us to even survive. And I have to use this word survive because it was surviving like it wasn't like 
um, the question of uh, how much money can I get so that I might be able maybe to educate myself, uh, can take part in society. No, it was only a matter of, okay, how do I make it possible that my bike won't broke, that I can fix my bike if it's broke, and that I uh, can pay my rent and maybe have a little bit of food, uh, um, free time activities. We almost never had it because there was no money left for those kind of stuff. So it was pretty hard time. And to this day, still many riders are in precarious situations. The situation has changed a little bit, but it's still very hard. Thanks. And maybe um, since I know, Ori, you were involved in trying to organize to improve your conditions, share a little bit about how you went about this and some of the challenges you faced. Yes. Um, first of all, we need to know when we started to organize, we didn't know about our rights, which is also um, a thing I have seen in many other um, work working sectors um, where the communities are working. Um, um, what I mean is like the people of color BPOCs and that many of us didn't knew about our right. We didn't knew that we had a right to organize. We didn't knew that there are actually labor laws who could um, prevent it. a few of those things happen to us. Um, so what it took is that a few uh, young people came to us and actually educated us. But even then, we were we very much successful, especially me, because the labor unions, um, yes, there were uh, repressed percentage of the working class, but for me as a black guy who never really solidarity um, or experience, experience in any kind of solidarity uh, from political institutions such as uh, labor unions, I was very skeptical, very distrustful towards many of my colleagues because they were all any kind of positive uh, experience with those kinds of political institutions. So um, it took a lot of time uh, by a few people who uh, educated our time when they gained our trust. We started to organize us and started to fight for a working council. And we were able to establish a working council, uh, the first working council in Germany in uh, at the living room. But, however, the problem in Germany, a working council is protected by being fired, like, the, like it's not possible to fire a work council member, but it is possible to remove a work council from a company by simply not renewing their contract. So this is like a big weakness, which Deliveroo, of course, exploited a lot. Um, by doing so, uh, they eliminated our working council and by doing so, eliminated our possibility at the company so that in reaction started to um, uh, start a social media online campaign because we were afraid um, that the public would ignore our situation because nobody really reacted to uh, our precarious situation. So we started uh, our social media uh, campaign on Facebook and Instagram called Leaf and Unlimited where we were able to um, gather a lot of support and uh, attention of the public so that we are now uh, able to fight with the labor union NGG Nautilus und Gaststätten um, for a better working condition. And now we are basically one of the uh, strongest unions uh, participated in Germany fighting uh, for working council and fighting for a collective working agreement. Thanks. Um, and if you were to make a, a recommendation to the European Union, uh, which is, I mean, the Commission is planning on making a, a legislation to better regulate platform work, what would be your some of your recommendations? From my experience, um, at the level, there were two kinds of um, options you could work like as a free rider. Um, what we noticed is that our colleagues who were freelancer, um, they never really got any kind of, they never got enough money. So um, what we recommended that there should be some kind of minimum wage for freelancers. 
um, because um, if not, it is highly likely because right now I'm in South Korea and I'm met, I'm meeting many delivery riders and it is crazy because for example, they are getting quicker and the same situation, the same venture freelancer also in, in Germany. And um, we don't want to have this precarious condition and um, I'm, I have met a few riders here in Korea and I'm totally shocked um, under what condition that they are like basically three years every day they are working for three years they didn't see their families because they're literally saving every coin they are getting and that's, and that's just because they're getting some kind of three zero for each other and that is crazy and so um, one of the recommendations I want to give is that um, there should be a minimum wage for freelancers. Fantastic. Uh, you're breaking up a little bit with the connection from, from Korea, but we heard loud and clear the recommendation uh, for, a, for a minimum wage for, for freelancers. So we'll get some responses to that as yeah. we go through. Thanks so much, Ori. I want now to turn to, to Kinga Milankovic, who's um, been working. Unfortunately. Ah, mm. Go ahead, Ori, please. Yeah. Oh, I think the moment I said that. Go on, Ori. Okay, sorry. Um, I just wanted to inform you, I'm going to leave soon because it's very late here and I can't stay for all the time, even okay. though I wish I could. Okay, well, thanks Thanks for, for joining and sharing your experience, Ori. Now to turn to, to, to Kinga. Um, you've been working uh, several years in, in the care sector, uh, but also researching the situation of care workers. Um, a little bit throughout Europe. So I, I want to invite you to share a little bit your own experience, but also some of the experiences of, of other workers in, in the sector. Kinga. Yes, uh, can you hear me all right? Yes. So hello everyone and uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'm Hungarian and uh, I work as a self-employed living carer in the UK since 2015 and uh, in the past uh, I worked for elderly homes as well either municipality owned or a for-profit one also in Malta and in Hungary uh, I didn't work in an elderly home in the UK so in the UK only as a, as a living carer and um, we also run a, a community support group back in Hungary for elderly carers and family members. This is a big uh, community with more than 10,000 people, carers and families. And uh, what I say is based on my experience as a carer in the different countries and the different setups, but also dozens and I don't know, possibly hundreds of um, discussions with other fellow carers and also family members um, in the different countries I'm interested in. And this is where I say uh, what I say from. This is the point of view. And I'd like to highlight two uh, issues that I think has an importance or relevance on a European level. The first one is uh, the issue of for-profit care setups. Uh, my experience, this is my personal experience, that when I work for a for-profit elderly home, I mean, everybody knows that uh, the whole sector is severely underfunded and there aren't enough carers and uh, care quality is often uh, very far from okay from the point of view of the elderly. But my experience working for for profit uh, for a for-profit was that just because uh, this profit thinking drove the management um, we were just pressed for example not to use as many towels as was needed because then it generated a lot of extra laundry work so one of the things i would like to highlight is that when in a sector where it's severely underfunded and there's profit taken out of the system instead of this money you know, put back to the system, to run the system. My, my, my argument and my question is also how, how do you want to run 
care when money is even taken out uh, from the setup. And I completely understand that um, it's difficult and it's in a way it's a good thing that at least businesses are willing to do this kind of job or work. Uh, so that I understand. My question is how we can um, make sure or at least do something that money is not taken away from the system, especially that money is limited in the system. And my other point is uh, related to the fact that um, that's again my personal experience that I feel as a migrant Eastern European care worker working in the UK that as a care worker in the UK, as a migrant care worker in the UK, my interest as a worker is represented at, and not only a worker, but as a, as a migrant worker, my interest is better represented in the UK than my fellow carer, fellow Hungarian carer colleagues back in Hungary. And I always try to highlight this because from the European point of view, I think this is crucial when uh, we try to somehow tackle the, the issue of care migrants uh, and the working conditions of care migrants. The, the situation is Hungary. In Hungary for the Hungarian carers, it's, it's so miserable, the working conditions, but also in interest representation that for me as a migrant carer, I would rather be a migrant care worker than a Hungarian care worker because of the work. And, and I'm not talking about only, definitely not only talking about the pay, that's of course very important, but the working conditions, the appreciation I receive, uh, unions and the support I get in my workplace. And um, quite often I feel that uh, each of the countries I see, for example, in the UK, it's not the care. Well, of course, there are issues with being a care migrant. So for the migrant carers, there are lots of issues that because we are migrants, uh, it's difficult. But I think the situation often for UK care workers or Western care workers is even worse because they just you know, they just can't make a living out of the little money that they make if they live in the particular country and they want to raise their family there, etc. So sometimes I feel that if we look at like Western care workers, Eastern care workers and the care migrants in between, the worst situation is the home carers from the three groups, if I may say that. So and in that respect, I think uh, it's very important that the European Union is paying attention to this particular fact. And uh, of course, the UK is not in the European Union now, but um, I feel that it, this would be very nice somehow to approach this issue from the European level and try to improve uh, working conditions from the nations itself for, for their own people, for their own carers because then this could somehow perhaps balance out uh, the situation that creates this care migration. Thanks, thanks for this, Kinga. Uh, um, you mentioned that you, you, you felt better represented in the UK than in Hungary as a care worker. Was that the case also in the other countries that you worked in? Malta, I think you mentioned another country as well, or is, so is it something specific about the UK and its trade union structure, or did you feel like you were somehow in a, in a better position also in Malta, for example? Um, what I experienced in Malta that uh, the very difficult situation was for those who were non-EU care workers, because they were taken advantage of via the visa regulations. And um, I didn't feel any disadvantage being a non-native uh, carer because I was protected by the European Union uh, leveling up in terms of uh, workers' conditions. So that's one thing. The other thing that I think uh, in countries where interest representation is stronger, for example, in the UK, and I, I hear that from the Netherlands as well, um, I would say that, uh, yeah, it was, it, it was worse in Malta. But again, it's worse also because it's worse for the Maltese carers as well. So like Maltese carers were leaving the sector 
and uh, they, they were replaced by non-European carers who, who could be taken advantage of because of the visa regulations. And it happened, it, it, it's happening. Thanks, that's, that's interesting. So if you were to summarize two, two recommendations for the European Union, what would you say, Kinga? That could be a very long list. I would name these two. Uh, one is somehow to tackle this issue that if profit is taken away from the system, then it would be very nice somehow to regulate it and uh, make sure that suffering for carers and the elderly is not growing because of this fact. And uh, the other one is somehow from the European level, try to intervene or do something about uh, these huge national inequalities in terms of working conditions in the member states. Great, thanks for this uh, very clear statement. I want to, to continue our conversation about care by inviting Leila to, to come in because Kinga raised the issue of the private care sector, um, which is growing in Europe and we might anticipate uh, has potential to grow um, dramatically over the coming years with an aging population. Uh, you have done investigations uh, on that for, for media part, if I'm not wrong, but also been involved in a, in a recent investigation in, by Investigating Europe um, into, into the care industry. Uh, perhaps share, share with us some of the things that you found, and if you're able to make the link to what you think it means for the rights of the carers themselves, um, this kind of uh, this kind of model that would be that would be fantastic, Leila. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. I wanted to start with a with a story uh, a caregiver uh, giver told me uh, during this uh, investigation. So it was in the center of France. She told me sometimes this job is almost a torture. She told me about a horrible practice they had in their care home. They were pressing the feet wound of the residents to make them open their mouths. This was the only way to make the resident open the mouth to wash their teeth. She knew that was bad. She was very, feeling terrible about it, but she was telling me simply, I have no time. I have no time to speak softly to the residents and to ask her to open her mouth because I have to um, cover 20 beds in the morning. That was, the, that was a terrible moment for me because um, uh, I realized that that was my first uh, interview I got with a caregiver. But then I had like probably 20 uh, like that during my investigation and my colleagues all across Europe at the same. Um, these um, these workers are working for the private for profit uh, care uh, sector were feeling like they were uh, doing mistreatment. They were uh, like this caregiver told me they were like torturing their own uh, residents uh, because they have no no means to uh, to work. Um, this is this is very because uh, you know and you have told uh, already is that this sector is understaffed is um, is uh, underfunded that is very known, uh, but what is not known is uh, how extreme the situation is. For instance, in France, um, the elder sector is the place where there is the biggest number of accidents in the workplace. Um, this is crazy. It's worse than the construction sector, for instance. It means that people who carry, uh, I don't know, uh, who build a house building have less accident than people, uh, than the caregivers. Because the caregivers, women mostly, carry the resident by themselves when there should be two or three people doing it. And this is terrible for the body in the long term because they continue day in day carrying uh, the, the, the residents by themselves when they should be two or three. And this creates this huge amount of accidents in the workplace. 
In France and in many European countries, the daily life of a uh, caregiver employee is like race, uh, race against the clock. Uh, you have to uh, go for the meal, for the shower, the, tre the, the treatment has to be distributed. It's like really you, you run everywhere. And um, so that's the, that's really the daily life that we have, well, we have observed uh, all over Europe. And um, like I told you, this is very known by the trade unionists and the personnel of the sector. And all they all tell you, no, it, this is nothing new. Uh, they nearly often have a cynical point of view um, on, on this saying, okay, what can be changed? Uh, well, it's desperate and no one cares. Maybe last year something changed because most um, of half of the COVID related death during the first two waves uh, were in the care homes. So we have uh, heard uh, so much story on care homes during the COVID that probably the, the, the interest of the politics uh, regarding care home changed, uh, changed a little. Of course, they were uh, more exposed because of the age and the level, their level of dependency. Uh, but the truth is that uh, because of these structural of underfunded and understaffed uh, situation, uh, which has been happening for years, uh, they were not ready to face uh, such a crisis. And uh, today, there is like 3.5 million of European citizens who are living in the care home. And uh, more and more, like you said, uh, European countries will have decided to leave the floor to this giant private company uh, who have run on this uh, silver tsunami, silver economy, of how they call it. For instance, take a state like Spain. Uh, have privatized the sector for 80%, or in the UK, you have 74% uh, uh, of the sector was privatized. In France, it's growing, Germany is growing. Everywhere it's growing, except in Norway. The Norway was done the, the way back. She has decided to uh, remunicipalize the, the care home uh, sector. But the main one of the main discovery we made uh, in um, in our investigation uh, was showing clearly that uh, the private for profit care uh, homes employ less people and pay them less than the public sector. That's the direct uh, <laughs> that the question uh, well, the answer to to the question um, you, you you ask. Uh, Previously, that's uh, that's when you employ less people and when you pay them less. Then, of course, uh, the workload uh, the workload on caregivers is growing and growing and growing. And um, for instance, just uh, Orpea, which is the, the biggest uh, group uh, in Europe, it's a French group and it's the biggest in Europe and one of and the biggest in the world actually spend 55% uh, of its revenue for salaries, when 70% is the average of non-profit. So uh, of course, the answer is always the same, saying, OK, that doesn't make difference because they have nice building, uh, because they have more machinery, they are more modern, et cetera. But the, the thing is that they employ less people and they pay them less. So the condition uh, of work are worse for people in the for-profit. And um, it's very rare, but last year the um, the French state, uh, French state uh, Department of Statistics called DRES has published uh, very interesting data showing that the con contamination in during the COVID pandemia was much higher in uh, for profit, for instance. And one of the reasons for that is that the fact that there were less people employed in uh, in the private for profit. And that shows the terrible con consequences of that. It seems to be logical because when uh, when you have a pandemic, you can you need more people to to isolate the the resident, to create special room, to take care of them twenty four hours. But uh, but the fact is that um, 
the all the world sector was not not ready to face the crisis but the private for profit were even more ready even less ready uh, to to face uh, these uh, this crisis and maybe the the future uh, crisis and with all that in and they, they do all that with charging the family with more money the the families and the residents they pay more in the pri private for profit they pay more for less people working in that it is the the irony and that's how they make their money that's what the the um, what what the care the colleague there um kinga milankovic was, was saying um it's uh, this uh, the private for profit is a lot uh, funded uh, by the states, so around uh, 220 billion euro uh, funded by the state, and the conditions here are terrible. The condition of work, uh, but they make so much money. They make so much profit. It's crazy. While the situation of the workers in the private for profit are getting worse and worse. Their bank accounts are growing, growing, growing. Just to give you an example, against with Orpea, the bigger one um, is uh, capitalization in the Paris Stock, Paris Stock Exchange uh, grew from 2.7 billion uh, to 9 billion in only five years. I'm not talking about million, but billions. So um, I think that's, uh, that's one of, uh, well, one of the things that we can observe uh, on the sectors. Thanks, thanks very much, uh, Leila, for this this kind of shocking statistics. I mean, it's almost unimaginable the um, the scales that are involved. But you can see why it's so attractive for investors. I want to try to to bring in um, Denny and Agnes to to hear what the European Union is doing. Just before I uh, just before I do that, I said I would try to. Um, share some ideas from the agricultural sector since our, our friends from, from that sector are not able to join um, today. I can't, I can't summarize their experience, but I can say that the things that we heard um, in terms of the difficulty that seasonal and agricultural workers were experiencing in Europe uh, were perhaps firstly that the uh, kinds of people doing this work on, on farms are often very mixed between nationals, EU nationals who've moved for seasonal work and undocumented people. Um, so there's, there's, they're all somehow in a similar situation, at least in terms of their workplace. And those workplaces are often um, unsafe uh, and notably the econ accommodation is not always uh, acceptable. So there were clear demands coming for the European Union to um, perhaps uh, take initiative to ensure decent and safe accommodation for um, agricultural workers. Um, and the second main experience perhaps to share is that uh, many of the agricultural workers explained that they were increasingly being paid based on the amounts of uh, food that they pick rather than the hours that they are um, working. Um, and that if there, if there was any attempt to um, to manage the amount of hours they were working in a day to to to, to keep it to a reasonable uh, amount, it was it was ra it was not done through giving people the opportunity to take a lunch break uh, during lunchtime, but rather by forcing them to sit out for a certain number of hours and then return to very quickly um, uh, picking their picking their uh, fruit or, or, or vegetables. Um, and so um, not really the, the uh, idea that they have a chance to rest and recuperate, but rather um, that they are uh, constantly ready to be thrown back into a kind of competitive uh, environment. And so um, um, that was often blamed on, on employers, uh, being in the agricultural sector being um, exploitative uh, and there was the call that we've heard also from people in the European Parliament 
that, for example, when it comes to EU subsidies, um, there should be a check on uh, decent uh, work conditions and respect of fundamental rights uh, for agricultural employers who are receiving uh, notably CAP subsidies, uh, but also other European Union uh, funding. So that, those are two messages coming from our agricultural uh, worker colleagues. I want now to give the opportunity to, to first Denny and then Agnes to say something about what the European Commission is, is doing and what the European Parliament is calling for. So please, Denny. Thank you. Thank you, Nicolo, for, for the invitation. And uh, first of all, um, I would like to uh, pass convey a message from my commissioner because he, you invited him and unfortunately he could not come. And uh, um, he felt very sorry about that, but he really insisted that uh, somebody from the director general would be there. So it's me. So, so sorry for you. It's me. But I'm very happy to be here. No, thanks for, for the invitation. It's not uh, every day that I have uh, the uh, opportunity uh, to exchange uh, well, with you and then with uh, people you know from from the very ground so uh, my ears they were all uh, open and I have uh, carefully listened uh, to the three of you uh, colleagues look um, so our subject is the workers without borders here in uh, the European Commission we call them mobile workers this is what uh, how, how we, we call you uh, so um, I mean um, we have uh, uh, the European Union uh, the, has done quite a, lo a lot in the past uh, few years to promote what we call a fair mobility agenda. Uh, so we, we have uh, uh, reviewed the, the posting directive and this uh, Mrs. young Rus knows it very well. She worked a lot and maybe she will say a couple of words on that uh, as the uh, co-rapporteur in the parliament. So this happened in 2018, but we started uh, already in 2016. We propose as well uh, a review of the uh, social security uh, coordination regulation because there, I mean, it's quite technical, but at the end, this is what matters and the social protections of mobile workers and, and, and so on. This is still uh, open. Uh, this is still open because it's a difficult file. It takes time, uh, but uh, some progress have been made in the negotiation, but it, this is still on our agenda. Uh, we have um, reviewed, I mean, this is a, a tool that we have US uh, to do matching between uh, to help those who want to have a career abroad. So we have modernized a bit uh, uh, the tool. Uh, we have as well uh, a new enforcement directives in the area of free movement to make sure that the rights uh, uh, of the rules, they are properly uh, enforced, applied. Um, and, and at the end of this process, uh, we have um, uh, set up, we have created a new, uh, a new body, a new uh, partner, uh, the European Labour Authority. So it's a new entity, it's a new, it's a European agency um, who is doing a lot of things uh, and uh, who uh, the decision, um, uh, the proposal was made by the Commission in March 2018 and I think we reached a deal already in less than one year, so together with the Parliament, with a lot of support from the Parliament, the Council, uh, some delegations were more supportive than others, but at the end we, we, uh, we made it and um, now it is uh, already operational, not fully because it takes time. Uh, they, uh, the colleagues, they are based in, uh, in Bratislava and maybe you have heard uh, that uh, last week uh, they organized an inspection, inspections between France and Bulgaria in the agricultural sector. Um, and um, uh, and the European Labour Authority organized this inspection, uh, make sure that you know the inspectors, they could uh, talk to each other, they could work together. And of course, this is uh, very much uh, welcome. So this was the, the whole idea behind. Uh, so um, fair agenda and fair agenda, uh, fair for the workers, because we know that fried, uh, that uh, mobile workers, they are indeed fried, right? We know, but uh, as well for the companies, you know, uh, they, the companies need a fair uh, level playing field. It's not normal that sometimes their competitors, they do not follow the rules. And so for those who follow the rules, it's difficult. Um, so this is what we have uh, been doing. So what uh, do we have now in the pipeline? Because we all know that this is um, in the pipeline today, it's mainly about enforcement. We really want that all the rules to be enforced. So this is um, quite high on our agenda. Of course, what, we ha what else do we have? We have uh, the uh, um, social uh, pillar action plan. So the, we have first the European pillar of social rights. And, uh, and then we have um, 
as you know, presented a, a very concrete action plan with concrete uh, measures, uh, and we are working on them. Uh, among those measures, uh, by the way, uh, we have the minimum wage initiative that we have uh, uh, discussed, um, that uh, uh, one of you uh, mentioned. Uh, we have as well an initiative on uh, platform workers, which is in the making uh, uh, still. Uh, we have as well a care strategy. Uh, our president, uh, Mrs. van der Leyen, uh, mentioned it in her speech. Uh, and this uh, care, EU care strategy includes as well an initiative on uh, long-term care. Um, we have, uh, so the momentum is very interesting. We have at the same time, you know, all the recovery plans that are sent to, 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 to us. And um, I mean, one, we are as DG Ampel uh, consulted in this process because they need to be endorsed by, by in a way by, 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 the, by the commission. And um, I mean, I can tell you that our agenda here is that this uh, very ambitious uh, twin transition, you know, green and digital is also just and fair. And this we, uh, we are, so this is our line to take and this we are promoting uh, very much. Uh, so voila, so um, th these are the, the main rendezvous that we have, but not only, for instance, uh, we have this posting, uh, uh, the posting directive that was adopted in 2018. And then um, uh, as we, uh, uh, this is what we're doing. So every four or five years, we are uh, assessing uh, the implement implementation of the directive. And so the commission will have to present a report in 2023. So we are already working on it. And uh, in, in this um, uh, evaluation report, uh, there will be a focus on, uh, um, uh, on, the, the, on the working conditions of temporary cross-border uh, uh, mobile workers and workers working in subcontracting chains. So this will be, and because we know that there, there is some interest that need to be uh, put into, into, in, into the matter. Uh, what is interesting as well is that there are other initiatives uh, in the commission which are not necessarily under our, under our responsibility. You mentioned already this uh, social conditionality in uh, CAP subsidies or in the common agricultural policy subsidies. Um, yes, so we, we've been uh, working closely on that together with our colleagues from the service in charge, DG Agri. There is an interesting um, uh, package uh, which will come as well. This is uh, initiated by another department in the commission, it's called DG Home. And uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, following the pact on immigration, on migration and asylum. Um, the commission has uh, um, uh, already announced that it will uh, present a skills and, and talent uh, package. So there will be a revision of the directive on long-term residence, a review of the single permit directive and um, the development of a, a talent pool as well. So this is about third country nationals and not those uh, um, workers, uh, this is not about intra-EU mobility, but those workers, you know, coming from the rest of the world, uh, Ukraine, uh, um, uh, many other countries. Uh, so this will be interesting as well, because the, um, we will, uh, the angle, you know, and declared work or illegal activities will be very, uh, uh, will be uh, very important there as well. Uh, so, what well, are initiatives uh, under our responsibility, other initiatives as well, still promoting this fair mobility uh, uh, agenda. Um, I, I'm happy now, maybe I will stop here, but then I'm, I will stay obviously. And then uh, if we, if I have questions, especially on the platform workers initiative, I could say a bit more, but let's wait for the discussion. And then I will now give the floor to Mrs. Jongoris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Indeed. Um, I, I have plenty of questions, but, but let's, let's save that for the, the discussion. I give the floor to Agnes. Okay, and, and uh, also from my side, thank you for inviting me because uh, this is a topic close to my heart. Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, as already uh, mentioned, uh, I've also in the previous mandate working uh, on this issue uh, uh, on the posting of workers uh, uh, directive. And before coming to the European Parliament, I worked for a very, very long time. Uh, for the Dutch trade union movement. Uh, so uh, labor mobility, uh, labor conditions in general, and especially for those uh, in the most vulnerable position uh, is something uh, I cannot talk enough about. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you, uh, Ori, I see he's gone to bed, uh, which is wise if you are in Seoul, but also thank uh, Kinga for your uh, personal 
uh, uh, stories. And, and Nicolo, I, I have to say, I also do recognize what you're telling about the workers in the agricultural uh, uh, sector. Um, stories are appalling all of the time. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, sadly, they are not new. Uh, but becoming more and more obvious. Uh, and in that sense, uh, the COVID pandemic also painfully demonstrated uh, what uh, some people have been warning about for a very long time already, uh, uh, but was perhaps not in the clear eyesight uh, uh, of the policymakers and perhaps also of the general uh, public. But we know that migrant workers are more at risk of exploitation and uh, they have difficulties uh, to get the proper social protection to get uh, access to trade union support to decent housing uh, uh, and uh, health uh, uh, services and and this is indeed in times of pandemic a even bigger uh, uh, problem uh, uh, and uh, 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 next to the uh, uh, the measures already mentioned uh, uh, by you, uh, uh, by uh, by Dennis about uh, uh, what has already uh, been uh, done, I do like the idea uh, that indeed the ELA started their first big campaign uh, uh, around seasonal workers uh, because this is indeed a a, a group of workers. Uh, very much uh, at uh, uh, at risk, but next to all the uh, um, initiatives which has already been taken, I think we need new initiatives at the table. Uh, we need a stronger regulation. Uh, we need more efficient monitoring uh, uh, and enforcement of decent working conditions. Because Kinga, uh, uh, I think you're right. Uh, uh, perhaps in your case, uh, your conditions were better in the UK, uh, uh, but the same condition should apply uh, also uh, in Hungary. Uh, uh, so we also have to talk about how do we uh, uh, indeed uh, enforce the rules and regulations which are there uh, uh, in all uh, uh, member states. And I think uh, I'd like to uh, uh, mention a few of new uh, uh, measures next to the ones already mentioned. And I think uh, the, the first thing I'd like to mention uh, is uh, the, uh, the temporary work agencies, uh, because most of the mobile workers are not coming by their own. They are being hired uh, in their own uh, country, uh, promised beautiful stories. Uh, uh, and then left to their own or to uh, horrible conditions uh, in the member states uh, where they start uh, uh, working. And I think it's clear uh, that the temporary uh, agencies are promising to better their worker conditions for a very long time, uh, uh, but they do not act uh, uh, by themselves. So I think we need uh, a, a revision of the directive, we need to close the loopholes. We have closed the loophole of the posting of workers directive, but now you see uh, uh, the same employers are using different methods. Uh, and one of the methods is just hiring an agency. Uh, I think we need to regulate uh, them. This one uh, is uh, uh, one thing for me. Second part of the post uh, of the previous package, but not being delivered yet. Uh, is what we call the European Social Security number. I think it should be clear uh, also for the workers themselves to which social protection they are entitled. Uh, 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 it should be clear uh, for themselves. It should be clear uh, indeed also for the employers who are hiring them via some kind of agency that indeed social contributions are being done. Uh, and I think it's also helpful for the labor inspectorates that uh, if they are indeed meeting someone uh, at shop floor level, uh, they can really with the social security number control uh, whether or not contributions has been done because there are too many stories of promises 
uh, and promises, uh, which seems to be empty uh, after unemployment or disability uh, uh, arise, because then uh, all of the sudden, no contributions are can be found uh, anywhere. So I think this is an instrument for inspection. It's an instrument for uh, the decent employers, but especially also for the workers themselves. You already mentioned the platform uh, 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 economy, and you also mentioned that we had a vote uh, on this uh, 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 last week uh, in Strasbourg. Um, uh, and I'm very happy with the outcome of the vote because the European Parliament, uh, other than uh, the suggestion or made, is not choosing for a minimum wage for freelancers, but saying, but those platform companies, they present themselves uh, as just working with freelancers, but in effect, they are employers. Uh, who just don't do uh, uh, follow the labor law, don't follow uh, the social uh, uh, systems of the different member states. And they do this in all member states in the same way. Uh, so they all say, uh, we are only an IT company. We have, of course, uh, uh, some uh, uh, account managers, but the drivers from Uber, the workers from Helpling, uh, the, uh, uh, the delivery uh, people uh, uh, for delivery, they are not on our playlist. And the European Parliament uh, is making a different choice. And I do hope that the Commission is going to follow uh, uh, our suggestions uh, when presenting uh, their proposal on the 8th of uh, December. We say, uh, let's assume uh, uh, all the people are on the playlist of uh, the platform company unless they can uh, 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 demonstrate for worker X uh, or worker I, uh, that that one is not on the uh, uh, payless. So we are working on a rebuttable assumption of a labor condition. Uh, then uh, the, uh, we don't need a minimum wage for freelancers. We just uh, 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 make, take care that people are indeed under the, uh, the labor law, uh, labor conditions, the minimum wage, uh, the unemployment schemes uh, uh, of the uh, different member states. Uh, and in that sense, we are also working in line with court case after court case. Uh, just yesterday uh, uh, in the Netherlands where I'm calling from, uh, uh, we had uh, won a second case uh, last week about Uber. Uh, uh, the, the Uber driver should be on the playlist, uh, and uh, uh, this week for uh, a platform called Helpling, uh, uh, where uh, the court has ruled uh, that these are uh, indeed not an IT company, but just a work agency, and that they should follow Dutch labor law, Dutch labor collective bargaining uh, uh, agreements, etc. So. Uh, and, and this is uh, happening uh, in the Netherlands, but it's happening everywhere in Europe. You see the platforms are still refusing to take their responsibility. So therefore, I think it's time that we force them. Uh, uh, Laila, uh, your story about um, the, um, the way uh, the workers in the care sector um, suffered uh, uh, more from uh, the COVID crisis uh, than other workers. Huh? Uh, your example of France. I think this is also something we should not uh, uh, forget. I think <coughs> uh, we are pushing uh, in the European Parliament for a real strategy in which we say uh, we want to have the guarantee that no one is dying from their work anymore in the year 2030. So we need better working conditions for everyone, uh, but especially <coughs> for the more uh, vulnerable uh, ones. And I think uh, this is indeed uh, something we should uh, not uh, forget. And then lastly, <coughs> excuse me, uh, lastly, I think we should also have uh, regulations around the housing conditions. Um, 
sorry, like I said, I'm coming from the Netherlands, um, and we are a rich country. Huh? Uh, uh, but if you see uh, how uh, uh, mobile workers, how migrant workers are being housed with four, six, eight people in one sleeping uh, uh, room, uh, sleeping on a dirty mattress, uh, and having to pay uh, over 100 euros every week uh, for this facility. Uh, I think this is a bloody shame. Uh, uh, and I think we should uh, indeed uh, end this as soon as possible. Uh, for me, this is uh, such a big disgrace uh, that housing, <coughs> decent housing should also be on our top priority list. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Agnes, for this, this, uh, these messages and this, and the, these ideas for the future. I want to um, see if if Kinga or Leila want to follow up with Dennis and Agnes. And I've also got a couple of questions I would like to ask based, based on our um, uh, on our discussion. But I don't want to monopolize by 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 putting my questions in first. So maybe I see whether. Kinga or, or, or Lady, you want to come in before me? Kinga, please. Yes, uh, I have a question that why are we talking about minimum wage as, a, as an aim? And uh, I say this uh, because I know how hard this job is. And if we want to do it uh, done by with the minimum wage, you know, People are not going to do this job in the nations. And I find it fascinating to watch what's happening in the UK at the moment now that they left the European Union. And I think uh, there's a lot to learn from what's happening there. For example, the lorry driver uh, salaries are rocketing now that they cannot fulfill those jobs uh, with the Eastern European drivers. And uh, I see myself that the care pay is rising now in the UK. Um, that's one thing. So my argument is that if we focus on minimum wage, you know, locals, national workers are not going to do this job if they have other options, especially if a country has a proper social security system. So I would rather go on, on an unemployment money than do this job for a minimum wage if I have to live on that. That's one thing. And regarding Leila's story, I'd like to really second what uh, she, what you, Leila, mentioned about this care uh, situation. And I would also like to say a story because we are actually forced to do illegal things on the job just because we are underfunded. And I can tell my personal experience when we are forced to feed someone because we only have a very limited time, like five minutes to feed a person. And this is my experience. I was there struggling with the spoon because the food comes out really hot from who, food hygiene purposes. And we have five minutes to feed. I was feeding this lady, old lady with severe dementia. She couldn't complain. I was trying to blow the food because it was so hot. Then they reminded me that I'm not allowed to blow the food because of food hygiene reasons again, which is reasonable, obviously. But then what can I do? I either don't feed her or, and that's, that's what I did at the end. I had to put, because she was so demented. She, so she was swallowing this piping hot food. So literally I'm forced to make these people suffer. And there was no way out actually. And this is really, as you say, Leila, this is really happening. This is the, real, the reality of the job. And this is, this is what's happening. Thank you, Kinga, for this. Um, Leila, maybe you have also some, some comments, some, some questions. Yes, very shortly. I think there is an effort to, to make at the EU level on the transparency question. Um, we have to, we have to struggle in all, all country and <laughs> with the EU Commission with everyone to get the data how much this uh, company get of public funding. We are talking about taxpayer money. We are not talking about uh, a bank secret or whatever other argument. We are talking about public funding, and I think transparency is one of the key to make this player accountable about how much you pay, 
how much you spend and how much money is going to Jersey. Because we are talking about money going to Jersey. It's not a secret. For instance, the third big player in Europe, it's Domusvi. It's now clearly proven that the benefits you make is, are going to Jersey. So it's, I'm not uh, revealing some very high scoop, you know. This is known. And how is it possible that uh, caregivers are obliged uh, to make suffer uh, old people resident there because their conditions are so bad uh, when I think there is something to, which doesn't cost a lot of money, <laughs> which is transparency. And I think that can be done. And of course, the question of regulation is very important. The lack of control in the care, uh, in the, in the care home are huge everywhere. In France, the number of control have went down for uh, 40% in the last four, uh, five years. No control. And because there is no money, <laughs> because they say, okay, all these uh, people are working for the state and they have less and less time and they are less and less, so there is no control. And when there is no control in that, that type of structure, then anything can happen. Anything can happen for the workers, anything can happen for the residents. And it's not the fault of the workers, like this big company try to put, uh, they always uh, answer us. Yes, but this is a problem, personal uh, problem of the workers, is a bad worker, is doing bad his job. But that's not the thing. They are the person who are doing this business. And when you're doing business with public funding, then you have to be uncountable. And I think there is a big hole uh, on this. Voila. Thank you, thanks. I, I want to just add uh, some dimension from Ori's perspective, since he's, he's, he's no longer here, um, that I, I hear the, the recommendation from the parliament uh, that, uh, that there's a presumption that anybody working for platforms is employed unless it can be proven otherwise. Um, I, it would be interesting to just get the maybe confirmation from the commission that that's the direction they're, they're going in. So I turn towards Denny with, with that question. But it leads me to perhaps a, a bigger question, which is that um, the pandemic has revealed that self-employed people in general are in a very vulnerable situation uh, in Europe, uh, particularly in a pandemic situation where there's um, uh, financial help coming for people who are employed, but not necessarily for self-employed people. Um, and it seems plausible that in the platform economy, even after um, a, a hopefully new European regulation forces the big players like Uber and Deliveroo and so on to recognize everybody as employees, there will still be some pockets where it's mostly self-employed people, or there will still be an option that they're self-employed people. So what can the EU do to better protect self-employed people um, in general would be my, would be my uh, wider question. And perhaps just to build on Kinga and, and Leila's remarks, given that von der Leyen announced a kind of EU care strategy, it would be interesting to hear more details about that if there are any, and how it might address some of the issues that, that Kinga and Leila were, were bringing up, notably about the, the effect of having more and more private capital uh, in the care industry. Um, and the way this undermines standards of care and for carers. So those, those are the things I want to add. And I turn back, uh, maybe Dennis first and Agnes, Agnes after, like we did last time. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, thanks, thanks for the, the, the questions. Well, we, um, as I said, we have an interesting momentum. We have um, this, uh, pillar of social rights, so which was, I think, uh, the, the, the first time uh, that it was discussed and endorsed at the very high level, level of the heads of states, European Parliament as well. Uh, this was uh, in Gothenburg, I think, in November 2017. And, and following that, so the, the, this idea is to have a new uh, European uh, social uh, rule book. This is a bit the, the idea. So how your relationship with the labor market, and once you are in a job, 
your working conditions and, and then your uh, social protections as well. So there, we, the idea is to have a kind of a decent um, uh, uh, scheme for, for all uh, European workers. And um, so I'm simplifying a lot, huh? but behind this, uh, there are um, dozens of uh, proposals in, in, in the pipeline. And uh, with a very interesting momentum, as I said, because of big support from, uh, from, from uh, the European institutions and even the heads of state. Um, the tiny problem here is that when the commission tables its proposals and discusses them with the council and the parliament as well, we have so many friends that we do not need enemies. Huh? Uh, so <laughs> uh, this is a bit the, the reality, but it makes the whole thing very interesting because we need to be convincing and we will come with uh, telling uh, uh, arguments and very good proposals. Um, so, uh, and then the, the second element here, which uh, is a bit linked to what we um, went through in the past 18 months, uh, almost two years, um, the, the, the news are good. I mean, the indicators, they are good. I mean, the, the economy is doing well. I mean, uh, I have not visited a lot of uh, uh, cities in Europe uh, in the summer, but I live in Brussels. I went to France a bit, I went a bit to Italy. There, there are building works everywhere. So, uh, the, and we are talking, uh, and we were not talking uh, about that before, but we are talking more and more about labor shortages. Oh, yes, in the UK as well, but the UK, I mean, they. Uh, well, you know, we know the reason why, and um, and indeed the, the the solution to that we should be aware. We should be careful because uh, there might be temptations to uh, cut some corners. So this should not happen, obviously. But of course, um, uh, one of the solutions here is to offer uh, decent uh, working conditions and salaries as well. Um, so so well. So this is a bit the context how we see it. So um, we have, uh, we are still following this fair mobility agenda. We promote fair working conditions. So this is uh, very high on our list. Concretely now about uh, the Europe, uh, so I'm coming back to the concrete proposal, uh, the European social security number. This is something we, we thought we, we, we would propose already two or three years ago, and it proved very difficult. So we have now, um, move to another project, but with a lot of similarities, uh, which we call, it's not my file, so I need to have a look at my notes as well, the European Social Security Pass. So this is uh, uh, what our, my colleagues are working on. So the idea is to improve the uh, portability of uh, social security rights uh, across uh, Europe. And um, this is a pilot project, which is ongoing with 10 member states. And um, one of the key or uh, measure uh, here is the digitalization of the uh, uh, of the procedures related to PDA1. So it's a bit technical. It's uh, your proof that you are affiliated to a social security system, and uh, this will allow, especially uh, the labor inspectors, when, when when they will do their control, uh, to um, uh, verify uh, uh, the coverage of of, uh, of the workers. So uh, this is already, um, um, it is a pro promising project with 10 uh, member states and it's uh, going quite uh, well. And um, so this is uh, about the European social uh, security uh, path. About um, platform work. So platform work uh, here, um, I mean, there are pros and cons. We are all aware of that. Huh? Uh, it's a new business model. Uh, uh, it uh, offers uh, flexible uh, uh, working arrangements uh, uh, for some of the workers. Uh, they have the possibility to get additional uh, income. Uh, this we know all the all the all the pros, but there are um, uh, um, there are aspects which are uh, less uh, not that positive. Uh, precariousness is one of them, and this we could see especially in the uh, uh, during the COVID nineteen uh, crisis. And um, the, that those workers, they are very much vulnerable um, for accessing social protection. And uh, there were as well as uh, health and uh, safety issues. So um, we have engaged a process with the social partners. So it's a bit technical to have one stage, two stages on, which closed, um, uh, I think, uh, mid of September, so la la last week. Um, what we, I mean, there is a, a, a interesting ambition here. Um, what we have learned, uh, yeah, this will be a bit uh, banal with what, what I will say, but uh, we all know that platform work will stay. 
it will stay, it will even, uh, it's likely to uh, spread uh, further. So the idea is to make the best out of it uh, while uh, ensuring dignity. I think dignity is a key, key word. Um, so we are working on the proposal. I cannot say much about it because it's uh, quite complex. Uh, what I know that is that uh, the consultation of the social partners uh, proved extremely useful and that they will be part as well of the, of, of the whole initiative. They will play a key role in the implementation of what, we, of what the commission will propose by the end of the year. So this is um, what I can say on platform work. And then indeed, there are other aspects. I mean, it's not the first time that I'm hearing Mr. Jongreste uh, talking about uh, housing conditions of mobile workers, indeed. So there we, it is on our list. We have not mm, a clear approach to that yet, but um, it, this is a real issue. This is, we, we, we know that uh, uh, very well. Um, well, I think I, I will stop here, but I will stay again. If I missed something, uh, please remind me and I'm happy to, to uh, continue uh, my, my, my reply. Merci. Thank you. Merci. Agnès, maybe you want to pick up? Uh, uh, I'd, I'd like to pick up on the issue Kinga uh, put on the table. Uh, why are we talking about minimum wage? Huh? Uh, uh, um, um, because I think this is indeed uh, a good question. Uh, um, but uh, uh, still, I'd like to mention two things. Uh, uh, because at the moment, I'm also working on the proposal, a directive on minimum wages and collective bargaining. You see uh, in uh, the whole of the European Union, there are plenty millions of people working hard and still uh, uh, getting only minimum wage. And you also see that in a lot of member states, uh, uh, including mine, uh, the minimum wage itself has been left behind. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, people working uh, for minimum wage jobs, uh, they are uh, hardly able to really uh, lead a decent life. And I think <clears throat> uh, while in the previous crisis at the European Union, uh, for instance, in the direction of Greece and Portugal, uh, as said, you have to lower, eh? uh, you have problems uh, 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 with your uh, uh, yearly budget, so lower your minimum wage. Um, uh, I, I think we should guarantee that this is not going to happen anymore. Uh, uh, so I think the proposal, uh, on the one hand, uh, uh, is trying to formulate, can we, uh, at the European level, of course, we, had, we cannot work towards one minimum wage for all Europe, at least not in my lifetime, uh, uh, but we can push for uh, decent minimum wages all over uh, uh, Europe. Uh, 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 and this is uh, what we are working on uh, at, uh, uh, at the moment. While at the same time, we also recognize that the best way uh, 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 for um, uh, working towards a society uh, which is equal and doing justice to everyone is a society with higher coverage uh, of collective bargaining. So the proposal is also about how can we uh, uh, all over Europe uh, uh, work towards uh, more people under the uh, uh, under a collective uh, uh, bargaining uh, 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 agreement. I think this is important, uh, uh, and we know that uh, in a lot of member states the coverage ratio has been decreasing, decreasing, decreasing. There have been uh, large attacks uh, uh, to uh, trade unions and the operation of uh, uh, trade unions. So we really need to. Uh, 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 work towards a different route out because I think, uh, yes, in the care sector, uh, uh, people deserve a decent collective agreement with decent wages. But we also know that if we are not able to push for that, uh, there are people uh, doing the job for uh, the minimum wage. So we'd have to do an end. Uh, and next to that, uh, uh, oh no, uh, I'll come back to that. Uh, and uh, uh, we're also uh, trying to see if we can 
uh, uh, a work towards the direction uh, Lila pointed and Nicola, you also uh, mentioned, cannot we ask that private, uh, no, that public money is spent uh, only uh, for decent working conditions. Huh? So uh, in the European uh, uh, arena, we are talking about public procurement, but can you not say public money uh, uh, is uh, uh, only spent with those employers uh, 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 who are uh, guaranteeing that they pay their people uh, uh, in, uh, in line with a decent uh, uh, collective uh, agreement. That's difficult. Huh? We, we have succeeded in, 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 in a little bit of wording around this in the agricultural sector for the first time. Uh, 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 and uh, to be seen if this is really helpful, but I think the public procurement uh, 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 is perhaps uh, uh, one of the ways uh, of uh, uh, getting uh, more done in, in this sense. So the proposal around minimum wage is on minimum wage, uh, on collective bargaining and on uh, uh, trade union rights and public procurement. Uh, and I think we need all three of them uh, uh, to indeed um, and make it the, the work in the care sector uh, is of course uh, a, a beautiful job uh, if you're not forced to do the things uh, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, Kinga uh, and you're not working in uh, 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 indecent working conditions as you have mentioned uh, uh, Lila but I, I think uh, uh, we need to push uh, uh, for that uh, together and see all instruments we can can use. And and there uh, one last remark uh, from my side. Um, uh, I don't uh, want to sound alarmist or uh, 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 I don't want to warn again uh, what's uh, uh, happening. But for me. Uh, the fact that uh, for employers who are trying to squeeze as much out of their workers as possible, the option of third country nationals uh, is also a possibility. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, we have no real enforceable rules uh, around this is uh, uh, also something we should be uh, uh, aware of. Uh, uh, but uh, instead of the route, Kinga, you mentioned for the UK, uh, 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 where the truck drivers are now earning uh, 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 a better income, well done for them. I encounter uh, at the European labor markets, uh, uh, people coming from Vietnam or the Philippines uh, 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 with uh, two, three uh, agencies uh, 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 in between it. So uh, they are uh, uh, hired in the Philippines, sent to Lithuania, uh, 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 coming uh, via Poland to, let's say, Belgium. Uh, and those uh, workers uh, or the workers, workers from Kazakhstan or Belarus or uh, uh, they're not protected uh, uh, by, by decent labor law uh, uh, at all. And I, I'm very much afraid that we have to wait for uh, big, big problems uh, until someone is getting active uh, uh, on that sense. And in my, uh, in my eye, labor mobility uh, uh, is uh, also a worker's right, but there is too much exploitation uh, around this labor mobility, and we have to face uh, the facts uh, in uh, in that sense. Thanks, Agnes. I mean, at least from uh, the conversations that we've had as part of this project, you're definitely right to sound the alarm bells around this issue of of third country uh, nationals, and indeed one of the um, demands that we put in our our report coming out of our project is that the European Labour Authority should look at, uh, should ensure the rights not only of European nationals who are moving, uh, but, but anybody who's moving in the European Union 
uh, for work, whether they are third country nationals or others. Um, it, uh, with our discussion on, on minimum wage, I was reminded that uh, for much of this pandemic, uh, with increased talk about essential workers, I've often thought that it seems like the more essential your work is, the less you're paid. Uh, the teachers, cleaners, the hospital workers, the delivery people, and so on, all of these, you know, everybody applauding essential work. But um, this is really the moment to say, okay, it's essential work, it should be paid accordingly. Uh, we received a question from the audience, which I want to put as, as, as the last question, because I think everybody can perhaps say something to it. It touches on something that Agnes uh, mentioned, which is about the possibility of workers organizing themselves, whether for collective bargaining or otherwise to try to advance their rights. One of the things that is noticeable about the three sectors we've been looking at, platform, care and agricultural, in different ways, is that it's difficult for workers to organize themselves. Um, in, and these sectors are less well represented by trade unions uh, than, than some other sectors. So the question um, really to each of us perhaps to say something quickly on before we close is what can uh, the European Union do to help uh, people in these sectors to be able to organize themselves or um, if you're not representing the European Union here, <laughs> what, what do you think that workers themselves perhaps can do to better organize, organize themselves in these sectors? Uh, so I hope the question's clear coming from the audience. Maybe, um, is there a volunteer to go first? Otherwise I pick on someone who wants to go on the question. Denny, you're first. Yeah, I, I would start with, um, I'm, I mean, given her experience and this is younger than central, will have a much better reply. Um, what I can say is that um, uh, we really believe in social dialogue. Um, and in the European Commission, I mean, we have a, a vice president in charge of social dialogue. My commissioner as well is, is, uh, has a social dialogue very close to his heart, but not only to his heart. I mean, we have a, a unit, and this is a, a indigenous ample um, uh, um, organizing this uh, dialogue uh, with all the social partners organization. And what I can tell uh, the colleagues is that it is extremely useful. S sometimes it's institutionalized, so we have to consult them, you know, first step, second step. But not only, I mean, I, 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 in my previous job, when I was uh, supervising the implementation of the European Social Fund, big fund, uh, in Italy, a lot of money, um, in all monitoring committees, we had the representative of the uh, local social partners, so not the social partners that we meet here in Brussels, but those, you know, really uh, busy on the ground, um, and it was extremely useful. It was, uh, they were intervening, they were uh, making some suggestions uh, as well, and sometimes not happy about the way the money was sent, uh, spent and so on. Um, so, what I, so, and the advice I could give is that, I mean, in all member states, luckily, uh, this is part of our values and uh, democracy, uh, democratic model. Um, there are uh, uh, social partners organizations, there are trade unions, and they are well established. And they, I'm sure that they would be more than happy to uh, widen the, the scope, and they have already, uh, I'm sure. Uh, but they, it's through these channels that we would be very happy to engage uh, discussions. So, voila, uh, go for it. Uh, we Social dialogue is, uh, uh, is uh, very, um, I mean, it's uh, an activity uh, that we, uh, um, that um, merits all our intention and this is what we, we're doing actually. Okay, thank you. And yes. My, uh, um, a social dialogue, uh, I, I would have mentioned uh, uh, indeed, uh, 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 like I said in the, in the report on, uh, uh, on, and the minimum basis proposal, we are also trying to define, uh, let's say, uh, let's ask of the member states that they make uh, a concrete plans uh, uh, also uh, uh, how they can raise the level of uh, uh, coverage of collective bargaining. And, and that's indeed about uh, uh, trade unions and trade union rights. Uh, uh, we know uh, that uh, sometimes we encounter in Europe uh, practices I thought we only saw uh, on the other side 
of the Atlantic uh, uh, around trade union busting, but you see uh, 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 some sometimes in U.S. companies introducing the same models uh, uh, on the European continent, and uh, uh, we are uh, now uh, trying to push back. Uh, but uh, let me say uh, 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 one of the reasons uh, why I am in favor uh, for the platform economy that we have this rebuttable uh, assumption of a work relationship is that we know that uh, uh, if a worker uh, from Uber or Deliveroo, uh, if uh, he or she wants to have their rights, uh, uh, they have to go to court individually. Uh, luckily, there are trade unions active and giving legal support, but uh, 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 you know, uh, yet you're asking the bravest step uh, of the most vulnerable workers. Uh, uh, um, uh, and I think uh, um, and we also know that those companies have like big lawyer teams uh, 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 where you can be easily uh, intimidated uh, uh, by. So I think this is also a way of rebalancing uh, between uh, uh, employer uh, and uh, employee. I think this is uh, going to, uh, uh, to help. Uh, uh, and in general, uh, support the union. Uh, uh, um, uh, I think we cannot tell the positive stories about trade union membership uh, uh, often enough. Thank you. Uh, I want to give uh, Leila or Kinga the opportunity to either react to this question or give some kind of final uh, remarks before we wrap up. So maybe Leila, I know you need to go very shortly, so I'll give you the opportunity first. Uh, no, but it's okay. I think uh, Kinga, just uh, go. I've, I think I've said. Okay. Except that if you want to, uh, you can... Uh, uh, read all our story everywhere in our website. Uh, so when register in you, our newsletter, etc., you can read have a more detail than what I said. And we are publishing in many languages, so you can probably find your language. Uh, Hungarian too, actually. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Kinga. Uh, well the question of how we, how we can organize better and what we can do as carers or uh, families uh, uh, being under pressure of elderly care that's that's a, i think it's a very good question and we struggle with that a lot actually especially with this hungarian program that we are running with as i said more than 10,000 members and we struggle a lot and what i see is that carers are typically like 40 50 plus women who take up these kind of jobs because they have children and uh, they are kind of um, forced into this kind of jobs. And this generation is not, we don't, we don't really have the appetite to organize. We are just waiting for retirement most of the time. And what we see is young people are not willing to take up these jobs, especially if they decide not to have children or just stay away from this care industry. So we just don't really see how we could organize better just because of the lack of appetite for the time being at least. We don't see young ones coming into the sector with more energy and power and willing to organize. And uh, at the moment, I, I think it will be sooner, even higher shortages of, of, of uh, labor before we have the critical mass to organize better and maybe i'm wrong on that uh, but we struggle a lot actually with this question trying to find the the good and workable answers so we still have we still have some work to do i want to uh, bring it to a close referring to one of the slogans of our partners in other europe is possible and they have t-shirts which say build unions not borders <laughs> on them. I think it's a good slogan to summarize uh, the last side of our uh, discussion. Um, I would like to thank uh, everybody for taking part. Thanks to Denny, thanks to Agnes, thanks to Kinga, uh, Leila and Ori who have uh, already left us. Thanks to everybody who followed online um, and we'll be back soon with more such occasions.
Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye.